was great to be together again, and uh, to be able to worship our God is just an honor and a privilege, and it's so great to see everyone together uh, in your shorts this morning, and uh, I wore my shorts, and so Naki was like, when we were in the back, he said, so that means your message is going to be short then. I was like, well, I don't know. I might make it a little bit longer just for saying that. No, I'm just kidding. But I want to welcome you uh, uh, again. If you're a guest, we, we want to welcome you uh, for be, being here with us at DC Regional Christian Church. Uh, today is our, our annual uh, worship service and cookout for Memorial Day. We do this pretty much every year, uh, and we do it as part of one of our five we call discipleship disciplines. And it's an opportunity for us to come together and really share in fellowship over a meal. This was something that the early Christians did. This was something that was resonant in the Old Testament uh, with the people of Israel, that the people would often come together and just break bread, just sharing a meal together. Because something happens when you're eating food together, you're conversating, and especially if the food is good, amen? <laughs> and, uh, and Emmett and his crew are outside. They're getting it going, and uh, we're going to have a great time fellowshipping together. But before we do that, we're going to jump right on into the Word of God and just talk a little bit about this topic this morning, freedom in Christ, freedom in Christ. I am a child of God. I am a child of God. And really, I, it's interesting because we are celebrating uh, something very special. We do this every year in America. Memorial Day is a day that's actually set aside uh, to honor those that actually lost their lives while serving our country to provide the freedoms that we get to celebrate as Americans in the United States of America. And so this was something that was instituted literally year, hundreds of years ago uh, to just honor those servicemen and service women that gave their lives uh, so that we can celebrate the freedoms that we have. And in so many ways, that's a parallel to Jesus giving his life as a sacrifice for us so that we can celebrate the freedoms we have in Christ, which the ultimate one being is that we are children of God. And we're going to talk about what that means here in a little bit. Uh, I want to start with this announcement, though. I want to really just uh, applaud uh, some of the college-age students, uh, young, single uh, professionals uh, within our congregation that just said, you know what, hey, we want to do something for uh, the demographic of people that are around our age. And they said, we want to we have a ministry. We want to just pull some folks together and do some fun stuff. And uh, this past uh, Friday, they got together and had uh, a little bit of a gathering and a cookout. And they ended up having about 25 or 30 of their friends come together. <laughs> Again, and it was over food and fellowship. And they just had the most amazing time. And they were like, well, you know what, man? We're not done. We're just getting started. This is the first event. Uh, we want to have a couple more events throughout the summer and then continue to build on into the fall and into the future and then watch what God does. And, uh, and, and so if we can be praying for the Fuse ministry, you know, uh, and also um, they, they want to let you know that, man, they have a couple of events coming up, so stay tuned. You got to follow them on IG. That's, that's how the young folks roll. So, <laughs> and, uh, and, and they'll have all the new information coming on up. There's more to Come. So if you've got a young friend, a young person, family member, neighbor, uh, invite them to come along, and they're going to have a great time building some great relationships uh, with people that they love. So celebrating our freedoms in Christ, our freedom, just introducing his ministry. Some of the Jews didn't understand what he was doing, but as he was coming along, people started to figure out there was something different about Jesus, his mission, his ministry, his message, and what he was about. And one of the things that he, he preached in one of, one of his early sermons in his ministry was about this exact same theme, this exact same topic. I think we'll be able to take a lot away from this here this morning. So turn over to Luke chapter 4, and we're going to begin right here in verse 14. And Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole world, the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to, the, to read. <laughs> the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, 
He said, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. So first of all, Jesus wanted to come and preach a message of hope to those who was down or downtrodden or beat down to say, listen, because you're down, you don't have to stay down. One, at, at some point or another, man, you can get up. You can be whole again. You don't have to be where you are. And I think that's a message for some of us this morning. You don't have to stay wherever you are. God has a plan for you. And if you trust him, he can take you to where he wants you to be. Are you guys with me here? Because we can be poor in spirit. We can be financially poor sometimes, right? We can be poor in our relationships. We can be poor feeling men just in our own character or in our own, in, in, in our own convictions. And Jesus is saying, if that's where you are, that's not where you have to stay. Jesus is proclaiming good news to those who are poor. He says he's also sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners. And sometimes people can be in prison physically, but we can be in prison emotionally. We can be in prison spiritually. We can be in prison uh, 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 mentally even from time to time in our lives. He says, listen, I can proclaim freedom for those who've been imprisoned by different ex ex situations, experiences, or circumstances in life that you don't have to be locked up forever. That he's come to set us free. He came also to set recovery for sight for the blind, for those who have been blinded by life, blinded by dashed dreams, blinded by, by the obscurity of just man, political challenges and things of that, or just blinded by negativity, blinded by challenges in life. He's saying, listen, you can see again. You can dream again. You can believe again if that's you. And then to set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus came because he is what? He's a chain breaker, amen? amen. Has he broken chains in your life? He is a way maker. If, if there have been times in your life where you felt like there wasn't a way, amen, you prayed and Jesus made a way. Isn't he a way maker? Yeah. Isn't he a miracle worker in your life? I know he's a miracle worker in my life. He's a promise keeper. He's the light in the darkness. My God, that is who he is. He's a difference maker, a sight restorer, a guilt remover, a grace defender, a mercy keeper, a proclaimer of freedom, and he loves you. I can, is anybody here rejoicing with me this morning? You know, Jesus was preaching from this scroll. He's saying, listen, today, this scripture is going to be fulfilled in your hearing. And so the crowd that was there, they were excited about the message he was bringing. It was a message of hope a message of excitement, a message of joy, a message of renewal, a message of like, wow, finally something different, finally something new. And, uh, and for a while, they rejoiced. They were excited. And Jesus knew that, man, the time would come where perhaps they weren't really going to appreciate him for all that he was saying that was going on here. Because he understood that all this proclamation of Freedom and hope and joy and, 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 and fun and, and, and vision that it wasn't going to be easy. That something would have to be sacrificed for that to happen. That someone was going to have to go without in order for someone else to have something that he was proclaiming. But the people didn't know that. In fact, he goes on, he continues the second part of his sermon. Verse 22 it says, all spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself. And you will tell me, do here in your hometown what we've heard you do in Capernaum. Truly, I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his own hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel and Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. <laughs> and then there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha, the prophet, not yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. So he was starting to make a point. He was making a point that you guys are going to like me now because you like what I'm saying. But the minute I start to turn up the heat, you're not going to like me so much. And he started to turn up the heat by saying, 
the things that I'm about to say, you're not going to like because I'm going to challenge you to change. I'm going to challenge you to be different. I'm going to speak truth to the lies that you've been living. I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak, I'm going to speak uh, conviction into the compromise that you've been accepting. I'm going to call you to live a real life and not accept rationalization in your life anymore. I'm going to call you to obey the scriptures that you claim to be the word of God that you turn to your own advantage because you don't want to do what God wants you to do. And the minute Jesus started doing that, the minute Jesus started preaching that, the minute Jesus started coming at them, look at what happened. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. <laughs> now, I know you guys are looking. See, that's how the Bible is. You know, those people in the Bible, man. You know, Jesus, if, if, if I was in Jesus' time, man, I would have, I would have, man, I would have been following Jesus up and down. Really? <laughs> if you're like me, there are scriptures in the Bible that you love to read. You guys with me? Like, you know, man, may the Lord bless you and keep you. And make his face shine on you. And be gracious to you and give you peace. Those are good scriptures, aren't they? It's when, the, when Jesus turns it to us and says, man, if your brother sins against you seven times, you forgive him how many times? Seventy times. Se I don't like that scripture right there, Lord. Uh -uh, give me another one. Turn the other cheek. Which cheek you're talking about, right? We start to. Well, we love Jesus when Jesus say, "Man, I love you. You're awesome. You're great. You're awesome." But man, the minute the scriptures start to speak to our hearts confront our, 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 our rebellion or confront our stubbornness or confront the, the, the parts of our heart that didn't want to submit. Oh, I don't want to read the Bible no more. <laughs> What's the point that Jesus was trying to get us to understand? Simply this. Freedom is not free. Freedom costs. Freedom is not free. You know, the blessing, the benefit we get to be in America and to be able to pretty much do what we want, buy whatever you want, if you can afford it, if you can afford it, <laughs> live wherever you want to live, move about the country. I mean, that came at a cost. Someone had to die. Several people had to die in order for us to be able to have those freedoms. Spiritually speaking, the peace that we have, somebody paid for that. The joy that we have, somebody paid for that. The promises of God that we have access to, that we can hold on to, that we can claim and, and, and actually apply to our lives. Guess what? Jesus had to what? Pay for that. The power over your past and my past. Literally, the power to be able to say, get behind me, Satan. You don't have the hold over me like you used to. Because what I did is now covered by the blood of Jesus, and you can't accuse me with it anymore. That was paid for. You see, this is this is what this is the gospel. This is what the gospel is all about. It, 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 the, 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 you know, in, in our in America, Christianity in America hasn't really done the best job presenting what the gospel is all about. Because sometimes, uh, it, it, traditionally, we can feel like, all that, you know, I believe in Jesus. Jesus came to save my sins. Yes, he, he came, he died for our sins. He was buried. God raised him from the dead. But what we forget is that in order for our sins to be forgiven, he had to be sacrificed. And his sacrifice basically pro protected us from getting what our sins really deserved. In Isaiah 53, the Bible says that, man, he was punished 
so that we can have peace. He was bruised so that we can believe. He was beaten so that we didn't have to be beaten. Also that you can, you can, you know, you and I can, can really revel in the fact that we're children of God. Amen. We're children of God. But freedom is not free. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit? Who is in you? Speaking of the believers here. Whom you've received from God. You are not your own. Let me say that again. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. You were bought. There was a lot of money that was paid for you. You know, it's, it's funny. It's sometimes now as a parent, I understand this concept a whole lot more. Because when my kids were younger, they didn't have the concept that stuff had to be paid for. They would just say, Daddy, I, I want, you know? I want a pair of shoes, or, you know, sometimes they slip it in, I need a pair of shoes. And, you know, I need a pair of shoes that's a certain brand, or, you know, and, or I need a pair of shoes that has this certain design on it. Well, you don't really need that right there. You want that right there. You guys with me? Uh, you know, and I, I, I remember now when I was a kid, and I would go to my, my dad, I'd be like, Dad, I want. And he was like, what you, you know, you sure you want or you need? I'd be like, yeah, I need such and such. He's like, no, you don't need such and such. And he always had this, this thing. Boy, money don't grow on tree, you know? That's how they say it in the island. Money don't grow on tree. That's right. Money don't, you know, that's right. He heard that from somewhere too. Boy, money don't grow on tree. <laughs> but man, you know, Although salvation is a free gift, it cost. It cost Jesus everything. But the point is, he, he did it not because you and I were just perfect. I love this scripture. I love to be reminded of this scripture. I enjoy, I love preaching this scripture because he says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, somebody say powerless, powerless. Christ died for the spiritual. Christ died for the put together. Christ died for the those who show up on Sunday dressed in their best. No, 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 no. Christ died for what? The ungodly. Christ died for the sexually immoral. Christ died for the deceitful. Christ died for the adulterer. Christ died for the sexual immoral. Christ died for the prideful. Christ died for you and for me. Sometimes we can forget though. It wasn't because we had it all together. He paid the price. When Satan made us feel like we were worthless, he said, no, no, no. It was at that time you were worth the most to me. And you're still worth the most to me. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, <laughs> while we were still sinners, Christ died. You see, we got to remember that it was Jesus. We get to celebrate Memorial Day, not even we don't use the word celebrate, but commemorate Memorial Day. Every week, we share in the Lord's Supper. 
We get to remember. Wait. When I was ungodly. And even now when I'm still ungodly. Christ died. Christ died. Christ died for me. Christ died for you. So that you and I can be a child of God. You know, this scripture really resonated with me. You know, because I was studying out the book of Colossians. And as I've been reading it and reading it over and over again, Daryl was talking about it on Wednesday during our Bible study. How it's, it's just a book that's just so full of rich theology and depth in terms of understanding what Jesus really means to you and me personally, but what he means collectively to the world, that if Jesus didn't come, boy, we would really be without hope, lost without hope. And then he, and, 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 and in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 12, he says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. I mean, there's so much in this passage, there's so much in the, in the in chapter overall, there's so much in the entire book itself. But I, this verse just stood out to me. It just hit me like a ton of bricks. It's your chosen. And I'm chosen. Doesn't it feel good to be chosen? Yeah. I don't know about you, man. I used to play basketball. I used to go to the court sometimes and you know, there, there are some times, man, you show up at the court, and, uh, man, you didn't get chosen. <laughs> Dudes would just walk by, man. They did bring their friends and bring their crew because, you know, man, if you, if you pick the wrong people, you might, you might lose the first game. If you lose that first game, you don't get to play for a long time. So dudes, man, they look you up, up and down. Let me see. You know, if you're a new face, it's like they look you up and down. They see they size you up based on what you're wearing and all that kind of stuff. Boy, sometimes it's not good to be, it feels bad to not be chosen, but the minute you're chosen, I got you. I remember one time, man, this is so bad. I, you know, I still thought I had game and stuff like that. I was real young. I, you know, not young, but I was a little bit older. And uh, it was, I was playing with some younger guys. But in my mind, in my mind, I was like, I'm still young. But what they saw was something very different. <laughs> one guy just came up, man. He was, you know, he, 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 picking five people. He had four people. He was looking at a bunch of guys on the side and stuff like that. And in my spirit, I'm like, man, pick me, pick me, you know. And <laughs> he was like, ah, oh, you know, he looked at this guy, looked at that guy, and he looked at me, goes, I got old head. Me? <laughs> you got old head? That's when I knew it was like, okay, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have to find a different sport. I'm gonna have to find a different sport. Old head. I'll never forget that. <laughs> but it's something special to be chosen on a basketball court. It's something special if you're going out for the team as a middle school or a high school and you get chosen. It's something special to be chosen for the part in the band or in the school play. It's something special to be to be chosen, you know. Uh, by your peers as, you know, you know, one of the class superlatives. I don't know, best dress, best this, best that. There's something special about being chosen on your job to be, you know, employee of the month or employee of the year or supervisor. You're the best supervisor ever, best employee. There's something special about being chosen by people or our peers or, or those we respect or those that we look up to. Can you imagine? Meditate for a minute that you were chosen by the creator of the universe. And so, so, so not only did he choose you and say, hey, hey, I want you to become a child of God. He said, man, I chose you for a purpose. I chose you for a plan. Everybody say with me, I'm chosen. Now, there's an explanation point at the end of that. So you got to say it like that. You know what I'm saying? It's like, man, okay, you got to say it with me. I say, I'm chosen. I'm chosen. I am set apart. I am set apart. I am dearly loved. I am dearly loved. I am chosen. I am chosen. I am set apart. I am set apart. I am dearly loved. I am dearly loved. 
So when you go into your job on su- on Monday or Tuesday, Monday's a holiday. Okay, nobody can work on Monday or Tuesday. And things don't go as well as you, you planned. You might walk in and you go, oh man, you know, perhaps your, your boss is like, man, the, the, the project you're working on, it didn't, it didn't go as well. Man, you got to fix it. And all of a sudden, your insecurities flood you. You're like, oh, I'm not this, I'm not that. Because a lot of times we get our security from our jobs. As soon as he walks out your office, you go, or she walks out your office, you go, I'm chosen. I'm chosen. I'll fix it. No problem. Or if you're in a relationship and the relationship doesn't go the way that it's supposed to go, you were hoping for it to be something special, and all of a sudden, because this person is no longer in your life, sometimes Satan can start to lie to us and say, oh, you're not a special. You're not this. You're not that. Just say, I'm chosen. I'm chosen. Satan wants to lie to us. But God wants to tell us the truth. I'm set apart. I'm set apart. My life has purpose. On my worst day, God still wants to use me. On your worst day, God still wants to use you. You say, well, how do I know? Because the Bible says, man, when I'm weak, he is what? Strong. Therefore, I will what? Boast in my weaknesses. Paul says, man, when I'm weak, he's strong. So when you're weak, God wants to use you. You're set apart. And get this one. Man, you're dearly loved. God loves you and I so much. <laughs> dearly Loved. I know it doesn't feel like that sometimes. But he knows the hairs on your head. The scriptures it says that man, he's literally pretty much put a tattoo of you in his palm. There's a scripture in Zechariah, the Bible talks about how sometimes God sings over us. You are Dearly loved. Amen. Dearly loved. I say, but bro, you don't understand what I'm going through. You don't understand what I'm feeling. You don't understand the mistakes I made. You, you just don't, you don't understand. I just feel like I'm such a failure. I'm such a nobody. Sometimes I feel like I can't live up to this standard. Let me tell you something. You're dearly loved. <laughs> because while you were still Sinners, Christ died. So what are we to do with this? Children of God. He's shown you, O Mount Mortal, what is good. What does God require of you? Nothing about being perfect in here. He said you got to act right, though. (laughs) You act justly. I mean, you treat others the way you want to be treated. That means you love the way that Jesus loved you. That's a higher call of love. It's not, you don't love others the way that they've loved you because our love is such a, not the, the standard of love that God wants us to love with. He says, act justly. It means to love others with the love that Christ loves us with. Then he says to love mercy. You know, mercy is a funny thing. We don't really love mercy until we need mercy. It's like someone does something wrong to you. It's like, oh, man, go get him. You know, man, why'd you do that, bro? I'm like, Come on, man. What, what's, what's up with that? Ah, da, 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 until you need mercy. <laughs> until you fall short. Until you do something that you shouldn't have done. You go, can you give me some mercy? And I love this one. Walk humbly. Walk humbly with your God. Practically, what does that mean? What does this mean? Be a learner. This is like the essence of following Jesus. A disciple, the word disciple literally means student. 
that we never get to the point where we've learned enough. I hope we never get there in terms of, man, I, well, I read the Bible through and through. I, you know, I, Listen, there's so much more to learn about God in the scriptures if we have a heart to learn. How about just learning how to be whatever it is, the place of life that God has you in? How can I be the best unmarried person? How can I be the best married person? How can I be the best parent? How can I be the best follower of Jesus Christ? How can I be the best employee, employer, boss, support? Whatever role that you're in, always be constantly learning. The more you learn, the more you grow. The more you grow, the more inspired you are. The more inspired you are, the more you see how God is shaping your life for his plans and for his glory. Be a learner. Everybody say, be a learner. Be a learner. How about this one? Be a lifter. <laughs> Scripture says, lift Jesus up, and then he'll draw all men to himself. So that's the first thing. Let's lift Jesus high in our lives. Let's not, <laughs> let's not be the kind of believers that are CIA covert Christians. You guys with me here? You know, that don't mean you have to be rude and braudacious either, but man, you should not be ashamed of Jesus Christ. He died for you. Are you guys with me? Listen, somebody start talking crazy about Jesus. Say, look, man, he died for me. Anybody die for you? He died for me. I'm going to roll with him. You guys with me here? Okay. But lift others up. Look at ways of how you can lift others up. Starting right here in church. Today in the fellowship, while we're eating some chicken and some, some, some fish and some mac and cheese and some collard greens. Well, I'm hungry too. I'm ready. <laughs> Good boy. But while we're doing that and you're talking to somebody, look into their eyes. And feel their spirit. And if they need lifting up, give them a word of encouragement. And do it. Sister, don't quit. Brother, man, you, you need to repent. <laughs> Sister, man, you can do it. Don't stop. Come on, man, you can do it. Let's do this thing together. Let's pray together. I'll pray for you tomorrow. You pray for me. But be a lifter. You want to be the best employee in your job? Lift up your, other, your, your co-workers. Lift them up. Even when they don't deserve it. <laughs> or the ones who don't deserve it. Find a way to encourage them. It, we need more lifters in our world today, aren't we? Don't we? Yeah, yeah. Lift others up, don't tear others down. Be a listener. The Bible says be slow to speak. <laughs> Quick to listen. And slow to become angry. This is a skill that I think we need to learn and be better at. You might say, well, bro, I'm a great listener. Really? <laughs> well, ask the people that are close to you. Especially in a world that we live in where our time, our mind, our energies, our heart is so divided. Enjoy. This thing right here is a preventer of listening. It affects your skills to listen. So, first tip, put it down with the face down. In a conversation with someone, someone is asking for your attention, stop. Hear them out. Ask the second question. Well, what do you mean by that? Before you say, well, this is what you need to do. <laughs> Tell me more. Be a listener. You know, when you listen, you know this and I know this. People feel loved. When they, when they know that you listen, you might not even say a word. They go, yes. You know, you, you, you care because you took time to listen. Here's the last one. Be a leader. Oh, bro, I ain't no leader, man. I, you know, I'm, I, hey, listen, that, that's not for me. I know this, that, and the other. You know, I know. Listen, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you are a child of God, 
who was bought by the blood of Christ at a time when, man, when, when, when you were still ungodly. Let me tell you something. If you came to Christ, you know how to lead someone to the path that they can find Christ to. Can I get an amen on that right there? There is really very few things in life where you get greater fulfillment than saying, you know what, man? I, I, I was part of that process in helping such and such be led to a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can do that. Be a learner. Be a lifter. Be a listener. And let's be a leader. Here's a challenge for us this week. <laughs> Live like you've been bought by his blood. You can apply that a whole lot of different ways. And then love like you've been bought by his blood. Like you and I, we are children of God. At this time, we're going to remember Jesus. This is a Christian's memorial remembrance. In fact, Jesus said, for the church, he says, whenever you come together, break bread and, and fellowship and celebrate and have some exchange of heart, exchange of emotion. But he says, when you do that, I want you to do it personally with me. He says, you know, when, you, when you take the Lord's Supper, it's an exchange of heart. It's like we exchange our burdens for his blessings. We exchange our, 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 our struggles for his strength. Is there, there's an exchange that he wants to happen. He says, do this in remembrance of me. He says, How, what, will, what empowers you? When you see that bread, remember that my body was broken for you. It was broken. It was, it, it was beat. It was mutilated. And then he says, when you take the cup, you know, you see it, 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 wine, it, it looks red. He says, when you take that, remember that my blood was spilled for you. And that seals a covenant relationship between you and God. And that's a reminder that, man, his, he, he, his blood is enough to cover our sins. But it comes with a, a heart of gratitude, a heart of, man, I want to pledge a renewal, a new conscience, a new right. I, wa I want to stay focused and, and have a great relationship with you, Christ. And that's what communion is all about. So let's remember him at this time. Remember his sacrifice. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for calling us. Thank you for allowing us to be your children, God. Thank you for sacrificing everything. We get to celebrate the freedoms we have in you. And we are grateful. So be with us as we commune at this time. May you surrender our hearts. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul.
to say thank you, Lord, for loving me. Speak it up. I want to say thank you, Lord, for loving me. somebody to pray with you. If you're a guest and man, you're seeking for your relationship with God, trying to figure out man, your next steps, well, we're glad you're here. You came to the right place. And uh, we we'll also have some leaders in our, our visitor center. And we will greet you in there and meet you in there to help you make that decision or make those next steps in terms of your relationship with God. So, one last uh, announcement. Our sister Frederica, this is her last Sunday with us. Uh, she's actually moving back to Miami. And uh, we have been so blessed to have you as part of our fellowship. One of the family here. Um, we'll come down to visit you in Miami. Amen. But uh, just make sure we have some great fellowship with our sister Frederica. We love you, sister. And may God bless you. We love you with the love of the Lord. Frederica, stand up. Stand we love up. You with the love of the Lord. Everybody else sit down. She stands up. We see in you the glory of our King. And we love you with the love of the Lord. We love you with the love of the Lord. Amen. We are dismissed. Yeah.
like you're looking through a telescope. You see where you're gonna be.